this morning. You may be seated. If you have a Bible with you, let me encourage you to hold it up and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It, is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. it has God for its author, it has God for its author. Salvation, for its end, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth. For what, we believe, for what we believe and how we live. And how we live. Now and open up your copy of God's Word with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. I always prided myself growing up with good eyesight. I always had 20-20 vision. That is until I got a little bit older. As I became an adult, several things happened. Actually, two things happened that caused me to realize that my eyesight wasn't as good as it used to be. The first one happened in 1987. I vividly remember the date. We were at a Kansas City Royals ball game in Kansas City. And there in that stadium, the interstate is is across the road, a good bit from the stadium. And across the interstate, there's this building. And there was a a, um, sign on that building. And and I was looking at that sign, trying to figure out what that sign said. And my brother, who's nine years younger than I am, I asked my brother, can you read what that sign says? He said, yeah, I can read that. You can't read that? I said, no, I can't read that. My dad, who has glasses, said, son, you can't read that? I said, no, I can't read that. My wife who has contact said, you can't read that? I said, no, I can't read that. And by that time, I didn't believe they could read it either. I said, so what does it say? And my brother said, fellowship of Christian athletes. And I looked and I could tell that's what it said. And at that point, at 27 years of age, I realized that I could not see things at a distance as well as I used to could see things at a distance. The next event happened around 2003-2004. We were living in Orlando, and and as was always the case, I was sitting at the table reading the Orlando Sentinel. Remember newspapers? We we got the newspaper. I was reading the newspaper, and I was sitting there at the kitchen table trying to adjust the paper so I could see it better. And my wife picked up a pair of reading glasses that my father-in-law had left at our house. And she said, here, use these. And I said, I'm not going to use those. She said, use these. I said, I'm not going to use them. She said, put them on and try them. I put them on and went, whoa. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. And I realized at that point that I was getting a little bit older and I couldn't see as well as I could see when I was younger. I thank God I can still see, and I can see pretty good, but I'm so thankful for men like Matt Clary, an eye surgeon who has the ability to operate on people and help them see better when they can't see. But today I want us to look at a man who, who was born blind. Now understand, the Bible gives us several accounts of Jesus healing blind people. Five other times Jesus healed blind people. But this was the only account where Jesus healed a man who was born blind. This is the only place that word is used in the entire New Testament. As a matter of fact, the story tells us 
That since the beginning of time, when God created man, there had never been another miracle like this where God healed somebody who was born blind. And yet, that's what Jesus did with this man who was born blind. When he was pulled from his mother's womb, all he saw was darkness. He never was able to see a sunrise or a sunset. He never saw green grass or a blue sky. He never saw the love that comes from a mother's face or the pride that comes from a father's face. All he ever saw was darkness. And then he met Jesus and his life was forever changed. Now let me remind you that everything in the gospel of John is for a purpose. John told us that. John said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life and that by believing you might have life through him. John gave us this gospel so that we could believe in Jesus and have eternal life. There are seven miracles that are recorded in the gospel of John. All seven of those miracles are for one purpose. They are to remind us and point us to Jesus who is the Christ, the Son of God. As a matter of fact, this miracle in John chapter 9 is one of the evidences of the Messiah. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, talking for God, said he will give sight to the blind. When John the Baptist was in prison and he was questioning whether Jesus was truly the Messiah or not, he sent a messenger to Jesus. And and the messenger said, John wants to know, are you the one who is coming or are we to look for someone else? And Jesus said, go back and tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. That was evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. But as we read this story, there are some amazing truths I want us to see. So the best thing for us to do is just kind of walk through the scripture, and then I'm going to share some truths at the end. So let's begin at at verse 1 if we can. Verse 1 says this, Jesus was walking along, and he saw a man who had been blind from birth, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, as you read chapter 8, you discover that all of chapter 8 takes place in the temple courts. But as we end chapter 8, Jesus leaves the temple and he's walking along a road and he sees this man who was born blind. Verse 8 tells us that he was a beggar. You see, there wasn't a lot of occupational choices for a man born blind back in Jesus' day. Begging was about the only thing they could do. And so this man who was born blind sat beside the road day in, day out, hoping that someone would show him some kindness and some mercy by giving him some money. And Jesus comes to this man who was born blind. And instead of showing mercy to this man, Jesus' disciples began to ponder a theological question. They said, teacher, who sinned to cause this man to be born blind? Did he sin or or did his parents sin? You see, back in that day, they believed that all suffering was the result of sin. And so as this man was born blind, obviously someone sinned to cause this blindness. Either the man's parents had sinned and that resulted in him being born blind or the man sinned. That resulted in him being born blind. And you're probably saying, well, how could the man have sinned if he was born blind? Well, they believed in something in that day called prenatal sin. In, in other words, they believed that a baby inside the mother's womb could willfully sin. And they believed that, you know, like Jacob and Esau in the womb when they were battling and fighting together, that was prenatal sin going on there. And so they believed that sometimes a child with disabilities or handicap were born that way because they had sinned in the womb. They believed other times that, that it happened because the parents had sinned and, and the child was born this way because the parents had sinned. But I want you to listen to what Jesus says in verse 3. He said it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Now, I want you to understand in an absolute absolute sense, all sickness, all suffering is a result of sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. 
We are born into a sinful world, and because we're born into a sinful world, there is sickness, there is suffering, there is disease, there are disabilities. But you also need to understand in a personal sense, all sickness is not the result of some sin we committed or our parents committed. But the wonderful thing is, God can use our suffering. God can use our sickness so that we and others can see the power of God. And that's what Jesus is doing right here. I want you to consider Johnny Erickson Tata. How, how many of you have heard of Johnny Erickson Tata? Johnny Erickson Tata was paralyzed from the neck down because of a diving accident. But instead of moping and groaning and, and complaining and being depressed because God didn't heal her of her paralysis, she used that for the glory of God. And millions upon millions upon millions of people all over the world have heard her story of God's grace and God's mercy in the midst of difficult times. And God has even given her incredible gifts where she can paint um, with holding a paintbrush in her mouth and all these crazy things for the glory of God. It's amazing. And what we need to understand today is that God is oftentimes going to use things that happen in our life to display his power if we'll only let him. But it's here that we see this, this incredible and unusual miracle. Look at verse 6 and following. It says, Then he spit on the ground, made mud with saliva, spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which but Salome means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. So Jesus spit on the ground. He made a mud pie. He put the mud pie on the man's eyes. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man obviously had someone leading him to the pool of Siloam. He washed off the mud from his eyes. And all of a sudden, he could see. Jesus said, go wash it off and you're going to see. He trusted Jesus. He went and washed off the mud and he could see. But notice... You would think everybody would be amazed, everybody would be excited, everybody would be overwhelmed because of this amazing miracle. Man born blind can now see, but that's not what, what happened. Listen to what it says. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, but others said no. He just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud, spread it over my eyes, and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Now, why is it that we are prone to ask how when it comes to a miracle instead of saying wow? Isn't that what we do? I mean, we see a miracle, and we begin to question it. We begin to wonder, did it really happen? Someone is diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and and you, you pray for them, and they go back, and all of a sudden, a scan shows that there's no longer cancer there. And so immediately, we jump to the conclusion that the first scan must have been wrong, because certainly something like that couldn't really happen. And yet, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? Doesn't the Bible say that, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Now, I mean, where, where do we really get the idea that that, you know, Jesus healed and God healed for this certain period of time, but he, he no longer heals anymore. The, the Bible doesn't ever say that. So here's this man who was healed, born blind. Now he can see and everybody's saying, ah, we don't believe it. And so they asked the man, how did it happen? And he said, well, this man called Jesus. He put mud on my eye, told me to wash, and now I can see. I want you to notice something. He had never even seen Jesus. He was blind when Jesus put the mud on his eyes. He went to the pool of Siloam, washed it off. When he washed off and could see, Jesus was gone. All he knew was there was this man that they were calling Jesus that put mud on my eyes, and now I can see. And so by this point, his neighbors were thinking, okay, something strange here. And so they took him to the Pharisees, the religious leaders. That's always a bad thing to do. It's always a bad thing to do. Uh, notice what it says in verse 13. It says they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put mud over my eyes and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but 
but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? And the man replied, I think he must be a prophet. Now when the Pharisees learned that Jesus had healed this man, remember they hated Jesus. And so they were trying to now figure out some way to condemn Jesus because this occurred on the Sabbath day. So they were questioning this man, trying to get him to say something against Jesus that they could use against Jesus. So they they said, so who do you say this man is? And the man born blind said, well, I believe he's a prophet. Now, notice the progression. When the man first had sight, and they said, how did it happen? He said, well, this man whose name is Jesus put mud on my eyes and He healed me. He was just some man named Jesus. But now when he's asked again, he says, this Jesus who put mud over my eyes, he has to be a prophet. He has to be a prophet. I tell you, it's exciting to me when you begin to talk to people about Jesus and you see their progression from not believing to believing. And that's what this man is doing right here. His eyes are not only open physically, his eyes are being open spiritually to who Jesus is. But the religious leaders did not want to believe in Jesus. They did not want to believe that he was a prophet. And so to prove that this man wasn't healed, they called in his parents. And they questioned his parents. And his parents said, well, that's our son. He was born blind. Now he can see But you need to ask him how it happened because he's old enough to speak for himself. You see, they were afraid because the religious leaders have said, if anybody says Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. Listen to what it says in verse 20 and following. His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. Isn't it sad how many people refuse to take a stand for Jesus for fear of what someone else may say or do to them? I mean, I believe that our fear is the number one thing that keeps us from sharing our faith. We're afraid of being ostracized. We're Afraid of being laughed at, made fun of. We're afraid of not being in the in crowd anymore. And so we keep our faith to ourself. That's what these parents were doing right now. And so they called the man who had been healed to give further testimony. They wanted him to say that Jesus was a sinner. But this is where this man gives the classic line in verse 25. He says, I don't know whether he is a sinner The man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I see. I mean, you can't argue with that, amen. He said, I don't know whether this man was a sinner or not. I just know I was blind and now I can see. And so the Pharisees continued to question him, attempting to get him to say something about Jesus. And it is at this point that this man who was born blind made this great spiritual observation. Listen to what it says in verse 31. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. This is the man born blind speaking. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done this. Now, at this point, this man still hadn't been saved. But he is moving further along in his progression toward Jesus. He started out saying, this man named Jesus healed me. And then he said, this man named Jesus that healed me, he has to be a prophet. And then he said, this man named Jesus who healed me, who's a prophet, he was sent from God. Do you see how he's getting closer and closer to the truth? But it was at this point that the religious leaders got so angry at him that they began to hurl insults at him and they kicked him out of the temple. Notice what it says in verse 34. It says, you were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Now, the religious leaders were right. 
He was born a total sinner, as are you. The Bible says we're all born sinners. We are born with a sinful nature. And that's why as we grow up and we grow older, we choose to sin. Each and every one of us do. Matt and Jim, you got three boys there. Wonderful, good, handsome boys. But they're sinners, aren't they? Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, probably some of them more than the other ones. But we're sinners. You see, we're all born sinners. Each and every one of us are born sinners. So the religious leaders were right there, but they had everything else wrong. This man was born a sinner, but he was going to die saved because he was come to know Jesus. Now notice they threw him out of the synagogue. That was a big deal. If you were thrown out of the synagogue, you couldn't be employed. If you were thrown out of the synagogue, your parents would disown you. If you were thrown out of the synagogue, you weren't even given a proper burial. And if somebody tried to help you, the same thing would happen to them. So this man was cast out by the world. But what I want you to see is that he was sought out by the Lord. Verse 35, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. Jesus heard what had happened to this man and he sought after this man. He found the man and he asked, do you believe in the son of man? You need to understand that Jesus never waits for us to make the first move. Remember the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He seeks us long before we ever seek after him. He longs for us to be saved. And it's here that Jesus extends this invitation. He says, do you believe in the son of man? Now this point this man didn't understand everything but he was ready to learn he wanted to know the son of man and so in verse 36 the man answered who is he sir I want to believe in him you have seen him Jesus said and he is speaking to you yes Lord I believe the man said and he worshiped Jesus I want you to hear me Jesus will reveal himself to anyone who is searching it was here that this man experienced the greatest miracle of all. The greatest miracle in this story isn't that a man born blind was able to physically see. The greatest miracle is a man that was lost and headed to hell, now was saved and was headed to heaven. And I want you to notice what happened. As soon as he believed in Jesus, he worshipped Jesus. That will always happen. Listen. If you say that you are a child of God and you don't long to worship Jesus, then something's wrong with your relationship with Jesus. Now, notice the conversation that ended the chapter, beginning in verse 39. It says, Then Jesus told him, I entered the world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim that you can see. Jesus said, the reason you're guilty is because you think you can see, but you really can't. If you knew you were blind, then I could help you. You see, for Jesus to save us, we have to realize we're lost. And that's a big problem with a lot of people today. People think, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm not that bad. I'm not a, don't call me a sinner. That's an awful word. But the Bible says we've all sinned. And you know the crazy thing? You can sit back and you can talk to someone who says they're not a sinner. And you can then talk to them about life. And have you ever told a lie? And I was talking to a lady. I'm going to go ahead and share this now. I was talking to a lady Monday. I was cutting my hair and... Um, when I asked her, to, do you believe in Jesus? The conversation got there. She said, well, well, you know, not, not really. I said, what does that mean? And she told me, and we began to talk. And she said, well, tell me why Jesus died on the cross. Why did he die? I answered the question, because we're sinners. And she said, well, she said, basically, I'm not a sinner. I said, okay. Have you ever lied? You have? Well, the Bible says that's a sinner. It's a big one. I mean, a matter of fact, the Bible says God hates liars he hates liars this is a big deal to God and, and we begin to talk 
But you see, most people don't want to acknowledge their sin. Most people want to say, I'm pretty good. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm better than most people. I'm, I'm, I'm better than that, that Matt Geary. I mean, golly, man, he's a bad dude. Just kidding, Matt. Just kidding. But that's what we do. We compare ourselves to other people. And yet the Bible says that we are all sinners. And so here were these Pharisees who thought they could see, and Jesus said, well, you can't really see, and that's your problem, because if you knew you were blind, I could help you, but I can't help you because you think you can see. Now, what can we learn from this story? I want to give you some truths quickly, and then we're going to close. The first truth is this. Jesus sees us where we are. Day after day, people would pass that blind beggar and just walk right by. Jesus' disciples past that blind beggar. And instead of reaching out to help him, they begin to ask a theological question. But not Jesus. Jesus sees us right where we are. And Jesus cares enough for us to step into our situation and work on our behalf. One of the names for God in the Old Testament is El Roy. The God who sees God sees us in our need. God sees us in our despair. God sees us in our problems. God sees us. God sees the the parent who is sitting by their child in the hospital bed praying over their child. God sees that person who is laying on their back suffering in pain, praying for relief. God sees them. God sees that man or woman who is all alone because their spouse has left and said, I don't want to be married anymore. God sees them. God sees that person who is trying to go through their checkbook and they realize they don't have the money to pay their mortgage or their rent. God sees us where we are. I don't know where you are today, what you're facing today, But I'm here to tell you that God sees you right where you are. And God cares for you. The second truth we see here is that our situations are opportunities for the power of God to be displayed in our life. Our situations are opportunities for the power of God to be displayed in our life. I want you to listen again to what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. God said, this man was born blind so that I could display God's power in him and then through him. I want you to listen to me. I don't know what God wants to do in your life. You may be here this morning and you need a miracle. You need a physical healing. You need a relational healing. You need a a financial um, healing. You need a miracle of some kind. And God may want to move into your life and bring a miracle to you so that the power of God can be displayed. But at the same time, God may want to work in you and display his power in you as he gives you the grace to persevere in the midst of your suffering. Here's what I know. God wants to use your situation, whatever it is, to display his power. But you have to be willing to allow him to use it. Like for me. If you've been here for a while, you know I've had had two back surgeries now. And and my back's still not right. And and every day, pretty much every day, I pray, God, heal me. God, heal me. God, heal me. And every day until God says, quit praying that prayer, I'm going to pray, God, heal me. I believe God can heal me. And until God tells me he's not, I believe God's going to heal me. I'm just going to pray that prayer in faith, believing. But here's what I know. If God doesn't choose to heal my back and take the pain away, I'm still going to allow him to use my situation to bring glory to his name. And that's what we have to do if we know him and we love him. Here's the third thing we see here. Some people refuse to believe in Jesus in spite of clear evidence. That was the religious leaders. That, this passage says clearly they refused to believe. Now understand, they had seen miracles. They had heard Jesus teach. They had been in his presence. 
And it wasn't that they didn't have the evidence to believe. They just simply refused to believe. Can I tell you something? I believe that God is going to give you ample evidence to believe in him if you want to believe. Did you hear me? If your desire is to believe in Jesus and you don't today, he will give you all the evidence you need to believe. But here's what I know. Many people are given the evidence and yet somehow, some way beyond my understanding of why, they still refuse to believe. Here's the fourth truth. Many people's journey to salvation is progressive, so don't stop sharing. Uh, this man's journey to Jesus was progressive. It began with this man they called Jesus put mud on my eyes. Then he said this man they called Jesus is a prophet. Then he said this man that they called Jesus is not only a prophet, he's sent from God. And finally he fell down and worshipped Jesus because he realized that Jesus is the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now what does that have to say to us today? Don't stop sharing your faith. Just because someone doesn't give their heart and life to Jesus the first time you share, don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Just keep the door open and continue to share. Continue to love. Continue to minister. Because most people, most people aren't going to make a decision for Christ the very first time they hear about him. It's a progression to that point where they realize who Jesus is and what he did for them. So continue to share. Don't give up. Six, knowing Jesus, excuse me, five, when you begin to talk about Jesus, not everyone is going to be happy. That's what we see with the religious leaders. He was getting to know Jesus. He had been healed from his blindness. He was, he was living a life that he never had experienced before. He was happy and he wanted to tell people. But what did the religious leaders want to do? They wanted to shut him up. Not everyone is going to want to hear you tell about Jesus. Some people are going to say, I don't want to hear this. And so what do you do? Well, you go, okay, all right. And Jesus said, and this isn't harsh or mean, he said you shake the dust off your feet and you move on to somebody else. You see, if someone says, I don't want to talk about Jesus, you don't try to force it on them. There may come a time later on in their life where they do want to talk about him, but but if they don't want to talk about him, move to someone else. There's billions of people in the world. Surely you can find one that wants to talk about Jesus. And you keep knocking and you keep sharing until you find that one that's wanting to hear you talk about Jesus. Six, knowing Jesus leads to worshiping Jesus. As soon as this man knew who Jesus was, he began to worship him. I'm convinced that knowing Jesus always leads to worshiping Jesus. And we worship him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And we worship him not just on Sunday mornings. We worship him every day and every hour. Our lives are to be lives of worship. And finally, spiritual blindness is far worse than physical blindness. This man was born blind and he was able to see, but the Pharisees were the ones who were really in a bad shape because they thought they could see, but they were spiritually blind. They had seen miracles, they had heard teachings, and yet they were blind to who Jesus was. And that's a terrible place to be. Augustine, who is one of the early Christian fathers was accosted one day by a heathen who pulled out his idols and said, here is my God, show me your God. And Augustine said, I cannot show you my God, not because there is no God to show you, but because you have no eyes to see. Did you hear that? Augustine said, I can't show you my God, not because... He's not there. You just don't have the eyes to see him. And that's how it is with a lot of people in this world. That's how it is, I'm afraid, with a lot of people who are running our country today. They have no clue who Jesus really is. John Newton was a slave trader in the 1700s. 
He was an evil, vile, wicked man. But through a series of events, he became convicted of his sin and gave his heart and life to Jesus. And for 42 years, he preached the gospel. 82 years old, he was on his deathbed. And John Newton said, I have forgotten most things, but there are two things I remember. I am a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. Remember John Newton? He's the one who wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, a worm like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. Was blind, was blind. But now I see. What about you? Do you see? Do you know who Jesus is? Has he changed your life? Man, if he hasn't, I'm here to tell you, you were created by him and for him for a relationship. And today, the most important thing you can do is humble yourself before him and ask him to be your Savior and Lord. And he'll change everything about you. So if you don't know him, give your life to him today. But I realize most of us here today, we're, we're Christ followers. So there's two things I want to ask you to do as we go into our altar time today. One is I want to ask you to make a commitment to share Jesus' story because the majority of the world is in darkness waiting for someone to share the light so they can see. And we've been given that privilege and that responsibility. So I want to ask you to make a commitment to do that. But the second thing I want to ask you to do is I want to ask you as we have our altar time to come clean before God. Because in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate communion. And the Bible says that when we celebrate communion, before we ever take of the bread and the juice, we are to examine ourselves. to See if there's any sin in our life that needs to be confessed. Sins in our mind, sins in our heart sins of actions and so I want to ask you if you're a believer just come to this altar and ask God to search your heart show you anything that needs to be confessed confess it turn from it and get ready to celebrate the redemption we have through Jesus I want you to stand with me I'm going to pray our praise team is going to lead us in a song and then we're going to celebrate communion together Father God this is your time and I ask you to have your way in each and every one of our lives this morning. I pray, Father, that no one will leave here today who doesn't know you without coming to know you. And, Father, I pray every single believer in this room, Lord, will just make a commitment to live wholeheartedly, totally devoted to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our altar is open. Pastors.